Welcome to our service here this morning, the last of our Advent-themed services prior to Christmas. We welcome those who are here with us today and those who are joining us online again. We appreciate your fellowship and spending time with us. This morning is the last of the Advent-themed services, uh, looking this morning specifically at hope. Uh, we'll be looking in the book of 1 Peter chapter 1 at what Peter has to tell us about hope. But if we read uh, magazines or blogs or the news, whatever it is, we are being warned, we are being told right now that this is a tough time in the world today. Individuals are struggling, businesses are struggling. There is more depression, more anxiety, more frustration with life than is typical at this time of year. We, Barb and I, made a trip yesterday. We went to Calgary. It wasn't a shopping trip per se, although there did have to be shopping involved. But, but nor was it a visit, which is what we would typically go to Calgary for. We met Ashley, and in the parking lot at her work, we exchanged gifts. So that on Christmas Day, they would have our gifts, and Courtney's gifts went along, and and on Christmas Day, we would have their gifts. Why? Because we do not get to gather as we normally would. We, we looked at it, and we talked about it, and we just decided that it would be too tough on the grandkids if Grandma and Grandpa come and, and throw the gifts in the door, knock on the window, and wave at them, and then leave. The kids would wonder, why don't Grandma and Grandpa want to visit, which is what's normal. And the other side of that is, I don't know that I could tear my wife away from that situation, there would be hugs and other things going on. So we did. We met Ashley in the parking lot to exchange gifts. That's just not normal. And in many ways, it feels like it's not right. But it is what we are dealing with this year. Last night, we also spoke with some Christian friends. Uh, it's been a difficult year for them. You won't know them, so I can use their names. Randy has had heart issues. His heart issues have not been resolved. He is still going through treatments and trying to determine uh, what is wrong with him. His wife, Pat, has to get, is, is it monthly, Barb? Shots in her eyes on a monthly basis because difficulties with her seeing. I mean, there, there's just been a, a difficult year for them. But they do work together at a retail store. And uh, this last week, there was a single mother and her daughter that came in, and Randy has met, made their acquaintance over a period of time and was teasing the daughter about Christmas time and asking her what she was going to get, and she promptly resp responded, nothing. And the mother said, that's absolutely true. It has been that kind of a year for us. There are no Christmas gifts for anyone. And as Randy handed her, back, her receipt back, uh, her plumbing had uh, broke and partially flooded their basement. And so the parts they were picking up, as Randy gave her the receipt back, he gave her some cash so that they could buy some Christmas gifts and, and, and celebrate. And, and Randy, as he told us the story, he said, listen, it's not about me. It's about people's needs this year. We, the Christian community, really need to be aware how much society is hurting. We need to be aware of how we have an opportunity to minister that we haven't had before. I would say the majority of us here this morning were growing up in Canada as it was classified as a Christian country. And Canada is no longer classified as a Christian country. It hasn't been for a number of years. Matter of fact, when I went and I actually typed this in as a Google search. When did Canada stop being considered a Christian country? An immediate response, 1982. In 1982, we stopped being considered a Christian country. Pew Research Center, so it's a Christian organization, last year released these figures. That Christianity in Canada is decreasing and the nons, those are not associated with any church or religion, are increasing. But roughly 55% of the population in Canada claims some religious affiliation. Two-thirds of Canadian adults, so 64%, say that Christianity does not have, nor should not have, 
any influence in public life. That's shocking. I mean, we've talked about this in, the, in this process in dealing with COVID. We need to be praying for our government that there's an influence there. And yet 64% of adult Canadians right now do not believe that there's any reason for Christianity to have an influence in public life. They ask the question, how many Canadians engage regularly in traditional religious practices? So that would be going to church on a weekly basis or praying on a daily basis, that type of thing. Anybody want to guess? Again, 55% of Canadians claim to have a religious affiliation. So what do you think that number was for how many Canadians engage regularly in traditional religious practices? I, Pure, I heard yours 30%? 25 to 30. 25 to 30, it is. 29%. 29% of Canadians, only, only 29% of Canadians engage in traditional religious practices. Now, you know what, we understand this year's been different and difficult, and sometimes people have not been able to attend. But back in 2019, only 29%. But you know what's even scarier? 29% still leaves us higher than the U.S., France, and the U.K. Isn't that scary? Again, those who say that they are Christians are even not themselves practicing. This is the reality of our society today. But you consider those figures. 55% of the population claims to have a religious affiliation, yet 67% says that it has no place in public. That means that I did the calculations. At least 22% of those who would call themselves Christian believe it has no place in public life. That is scary. This world needs hope, but the world doesn't have it because they don't know God. And that's not to say that we who do know God don't struggle. We do. We know that. This has been a difficult year. And it's not to say there aren't people even here this morning that are hurting. We know that there are people within our fellowship that are hurting, and it may be in different ways. But in the midst of our struggles and pains, our hardships and our tribulations, we can still have hope because the source of our hope is a risen Savior. Amen? Let's look to 1 Peter. Look to the reading of God's Word. This should be familiar. We used part of this passage last week when we pulled out the statement, joy unspeakable and full of glory. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which, according to His abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, in him though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we look to your word for, for not just instruction in our lives, but for encouragement and support. As we come to this Advent theme of hope, may we find hope in your word. May it just enable and empower us in, in, in difficult times, Lord, to, to recognize who we are in you the promises, the covenants that you have made in your word that apply to us today. 
Lord, for those of us who are believers, we come before you with gratitude and praise. This we do pray in Jesus' name. Some year I might have to use this passage in Peter for the, all of the Advent theme sermons. And the reason is, in verse 2, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. In verse 3, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again unto a lively hope. In verse 7 and 8, praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love. And then in verse 8, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. So Peter gathers here in this passage all four Advent themes and, and, and wraps them up. And, and I appreciate receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. The, the, the Advent themes that we celebrate, so, so faith and love, and, or I should say hope, love, peace, and joy, are, are, are part of what we receive as part of our salvation. This morning, we're just going to look at hope, but, but not any hope. It, the word that's used in the King James Version is lively. Many other versions use the word um, living, living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It, it, as we were talking about the statistics earlier, we fall into the 18% of Canadians who are classified as Protestant. We have this living hope, and yet we know we can still struggle. We, we've heard this morning as we shared some of the struggles that we face. What about those that do not know the Lord? Where is their hope? For many years, you know, we could look at our health or our job security or career path. Uh, for some, it was arts and music or love and family. Uh, others, it might be fame and fortune. But, but in essence, all of those have been absolutely rocked this year. There are people without jobs. There are businesses that have gone under. All of these factors are affecting our community. People are living right now without hope. As I looked at Webster's Dictionary for, the, for a definition, it says, a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen or an optimistic state of mind based on an expectation of positive outcomes. How many of us are feeling positive this morning? O outside of the Lord, outside of the Lord, how many of us looking at society are feeling positive? It is, it is a tough time. Or wanting something to happen or to be the case. With all of these there is a certain amount of uncertainty. Came across an illustration. There was a story of a little boy standing at the foot of an escalator in a large department store. He was intently watching the handrail. He never took his eye off the handrail as the escalator kept going around and around and around. A salesperson had noted him standing there staring at the escalator handrail and was worried, so he walked over to the boy and asked him if he was lost. The little boy said, nope, I'm just waiting for my gum to come back. <laughs> but, 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 but that's a picture of hope in the world. As you watch the world go round and around and around, you're expecting to pick something up from it that gives you a, a glimmer of hope. That isn't the way it is with us as Christians. In the world today, I don't even know what to hope for. I'll be candid, I would have hoped to have spent Christmas with all of my family, and I'm not doing that. Um, do I hope that the COVID vaccines are successful beyond expectations and we, we see an impact, but yet we know that there's a number of people in our society that will not get the vaccines. So there's got to be more hope than, than just in the vaccines themselves. Do I hope for a return to normal services in the new year? Amen, I do. But I know it's our government that has an impact on how and what we can do as we meet in fellowship. I have employment. I am grateful for that, and I hope I keep it. The point being, what is there in the world today to give it hope? Where is the hope? I don't know about the rest of you, but for some reason, every time I said or wrote that as I was studying, does anybody know the image that comes to my mind? Where is the hope? I don't know where it comes from, but it's Billy Graham. I can see Billy Graham, Bible in hand, at a podium saying, where is the hope? So somewhere in my youth, I must have seen this. Where is the hope for people today? 
we, the Christian community, still have hope. Because our hope is not of this world. In verse 3, Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have a lively, living hope. Here's the difference. Our hope is not a wish. It's not even an expectation, is it? Our hope is a certainty. As we've expressed hope in the past, worldly hope, I might say something like, I hope the Flames do better this year. Um, I, I don't even know where hockey is at. I, I, I don't know what's transpiring there. I, I could hope, I, I hope Barb doesn't make Brussels sprouts for Christmas dinner this year. But I know I'm losing there because she bought them yesterday. Um, I hope Roman Reigns retains the Universal Wrestling Championship. And I threw that in just because I knew only one or two people here would even know who Roman Reigns is. Um, I hope this weather continues through Christmas so I don't have to get the tractor out and plow. My, I say that because Barb said yesterday, boy, I hope we get some cold weather and snow soon because she has a coat that she would like to wear. And it's too warm to wear in these conditions. As I talked to Alan, he said, yes, it could snow some more. We've only had... In, in, in my lifetime that I remember, a handful of Christmases with this little snow covering on the ground. It, it, how many feel like Christmas, honestly? Does it feel like Christmas to you? Christmas is what, five days away, six days away, whatever? Five? Does it feel like Christmas? It doesn't. It's an odd year. If I was a um, beauty pageant contestant, I could hope for world peace, but I really wouldn't believe in it. Why? Because people are people, and really they are worried about what they can get out of the world for themselves. The world's list of hope is a wish list, and our hope is as well if all we do is place it in worldly things. My friends, we serve a risen Savior. Do we believe that? Do we believe that, that, that God's Word is true in its entirety? If we do, we have hope because for certainty we know we have everlasting life. We have life eternal. We have all of the blessings and covenants and promises that are made in the word of God that apply to us now today. This isn't a future promise. We have it now. We have hope. We serve a risen Savior. We have, as Peter has written, a living hope. Now, as Christians, we have a living hope. That doesn't mean that we won't get caught up in false hopes. Again, we can, we can take our eyes off of Christ and, and look for worldly things. Uh, I hope for a new pair of wonderful slippers for Christmas because I wore the bottoms out of my last ones. I, I hope for restaurants to open soon so I can go back to Red Deer and get more baked brie at the keg. Uh, I do hope the hockey season starts soon because it's just comforting for me to watch hockey at home while I'm working. But you see, those are all based on worldly things. They may not come to fruition. If our eyes are on the world, our hope is still in worldly things, not in the abundant mercy and the awesome power of God the Father, who sent our Lord and Savior here that he might die upon the cross and be resurrected to bring us life. That is hope in a certainty. We know that that happened. So we come to a risen Savior, and if we believe that Christ is in fact a risen Savior, we believe in all the promises that are made to us. We believe the Bible is wholly true. There is eternal life that we will experience. There are mansions that are waiting for us, that God will remain faithful and give us strength. We have a good shepherd who will see us not just through the difficult times, but lead us to green pastures and still waters. Amen? It may mean he occasionally has to use the rod and staff on us, but that is a blessing as well. We have not been abandoned nor forsaken. Our God is able to, be, to provide exceeding abundantly for us. I really like that expression. I'm sorry. Exceedingly abundant. That is how our God sees us. Above all that we ask or think is how he supplies blessings to us. And in the midst of that, there is joy unspeakable and full of glory and there is a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
This is our God. These are our promises. And because of the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, as Peter records it, we have a living hope. It doesn't mean we get everything we want. It doesn't mean that life is without struggles and trials and temptations. It doesn't mean we have a life of ease and comfort. It means forever, now and eternity, we have the promise of an eternal relationship with the living God, with a risen Savior. In describing this living hope, here's what some of the commentaries said. The pulpit commentary said this, Christ's resurrection is the means by which our regeneration takes place. We have a living hope. It is the resurrection of Christ that makes our hope living and strong. Matthew Henry said, And this well-grounded hope of salvation is an active and living principle of obedience in the soul of the believer. John Wesley said, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath regenerated us to a living hope, and hope which implies true spiritual life, which revives the heart and makes the soul lively and vigorous. How many of us this morning feel lively and vigorous? We need that hope, don't we? Amen? It needs to speak into our lives. Pastor David Guzak, if any of you have read the Blue Letter Bible, here's what he said. In speaking with those who don't know Jesus, we shouldn't just tell them of the agonies of hell they will experience, but also of the glories of heaven they will miss. The glories of heaven they will miss. This is our hope. This is the promise that's made to us as Christians. The glory of heaven is ours. With no uncertainty, with no false wishes, it is a promise that is made to us in this word. My friends, heaven is coming. And it is ours if we but hear and believe. The hope we have is living. It is alive and meant to bring us life. Matter of fact, the word lively is the Greek word zao, which means to live, breathe, among the living, enjoy life, active, blessed, fresh, vigor, quick. That's the description that Peter's giving us here of our hope. That it is alive, it is breathing. We have an opportunity to enjoy it. It is active. It brings us blessings. Do we see that in our life today? In the midst of all that is going on, all that we have endured this year, and perhaps somewhat as we look forward to what the new year is going to bring, do we see the hope of Christ in our lives? We need to. Not just for ourselves, but the world out there that has no hope. Our hope needs to be visible to them. This is a picture of our present day hope. Not the hope that we will have one day once we're in heaven, but the hope that we have here and now today. It is a living hope. It is alive and well. What I really find interesting about this and what I really love is we see how God works in individuals. Who, who wrote this passage? An impetuous fisherman. Amen? As we look at Peter's life, that's what we see. An impetuous fisherman is now, because God has transformed him, he's teaching us theology and doctrine. It is amazing as we look at what God has done in converting Peter to be the rock. May God work in our lives. May there be a living hope that people see in us a transformation of our lives. Why? Because of who he is, not because of who we are but God at work in our lives. Except a man be begotten, unless we are born again, unless we are Christians, we do not have this hope. This world is not our home. We have something much, much better. Who here looks forward to the mansions that we are promised? Amen? We have a promise. Hope is only for Christians. Peter affirms this. We have been begotten again. Our hope is alive and living. Not from speculation or sentiment, but because Christ is involved in our very lives. Jesus' resurrection is the fountain of our hope. And in that resurrection, we find peace, love, joy, hope, mercy, forgiveness, all that accompanies it. Jesus is alive today, and so are we. He has made the provision that our hope is alive as well. 
I ask the question, where is your hope? In his book, in in conclusion this morning, in his book, uh, Max Lucado uh, wrote, Come Thirsty. He tells the story of a little Haitian orphan. Her name was Karenette. And he says that she lived in a different world than all the other orphans. She called it home to be. And and Max Lucado writes this, See the slender girl wearing the pink shirt? The girl with the long nose and bushy hair and a handful of photos? Ask to see them, Karenette will let you. Fail to ask, she will show you anyways. The photos bear the images of her future family she has been adopted. Her adoptive parents are friends of mine. Again, this is Max Lucado writing. Her adoptive parents are friends of mine. They brought her pictures, a teddy bear, granola bars and cookies. Karenette shared the goodies and asked the director to guard her bear. But she keeps the pictures with her. They remind her of her home to be. Within a month or two at the most, she'll be there. She knows the day is coming. Every opening of the gate jumps her heart. Any day now, her father will appear. He promised he would be back. He came once to claim her. He will come again to carry her home. Till then, she lives with a heart headed for home. Today, are our hearts headed for home? Do we have a living hope that lives within us? And may we live with that hope, that certainty. God has a better place for us. For our benediction this morning to carry us into this Christmas season, I would like to read Numbers. Um, I didn't put the chapter down, but I did put verses 24 to 26. I want to say Numbers 13, but I could be wrong. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen.